getting to. Hey everybody, hope you're doing great. It's 9.02. It's the last day of August, if you can believe it. Great month. Our son turned 26 this month, so we were totally stoked, uh, as always. Um, and welcome to the Morning Devo for Calvary Christian Fellowship. And let me see if I could get the right... There we go. See, we switched that up. And we're going to do a little editing as we do it on the fly because guess what we're doing today? We are starting a new book. And that book I'm going to put up right now is the book of Hebrews. So if you go to Hebrews and you go to chapter 1, that's where we're going to be for the next, I don't know, month or so. Maybe month, maybe not. Depends on how soon we get through it. Hey, welcome everybody. Hope you're doing great. So as you're working or getting ready for work, we're going to go through a little bit of the book of Hebrews this morning, and hopefully it'll bless you. Get your mind just on the word and on some of the principles here in this chapter that are so fun. And I got to tell you that the book of Hebrews is one of my favorite books. It probably is the favorite book of mine. Quick story. When I was reading the Bible at 17, I was in high school, and uh, I read the Bible starting at the book of Genesis and on my own, just picked it up, started reading. When I got into the book of Leviticus, I was really excited. It talked about that the um, the idea that atonement or uh, forgiveness of sins or covering over our sins was actually made through the blood, uh, the life blood of of an animal, and. And it made me think like, man, maybe we got to like sacrifice things. And I remember going up to my dad and saying, hey, dad, you know, um, I was reading in the Bible, like we got to sacrifice like for our sins. And my, it kind of threw my dad off because being from a, a, a kind of a secular home, not a kind of, but a secular home, um, not a church going home at all. My, and uh, I was in kind of a recovery home with my dad. We had roommates and things of that nature that were all in AA and my dad looked at me kind of like, what are you reading, boy? And uh, and I said, well, I'm reading the Bible. And he's like, whoa, what a trip. And I could tell he was a little taken by it. Like, uh, what are you talking about? You know, sacrifice. And and I thought, man, dude, maybe we got to sacrifice our dog or something. I don't know. And I know that sounds radical, but my, my dad then got a retired minister to come to the house like the following week. And he asked me what I was reading and I was reading, I told him I'm reading the Bible and I'm, I'm in the book of Leviticus and I'm, you know, been just reading straight through. And, and he, after he told me to uh, finish reading the book of Leviticus, he told me to read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And there's a reason why it's because the, the New Testament book of Hebrews is a commentary on the Old Testament sacrificial system in a lot of ways. And uh, so it helped me understand more of the, the purpose of Jesus Christ and what Jesus came to do to be our Passover lamb that was sacrificed and what that meant. Now, you got to understand that Christianity is fulfilled Judaism. That's what it is. And so when we're reading the Bible, we're reading uh, Hebrew literature um, and um, and. So the book of Hebrews, as it's uh, titled, is written to Hebrews. It's written to the Jews. When was this book written? It was probably written before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Um, the temple that Jesus walked through during his time, and you might remember Jesus made a, a, a cord of whips and things of that nature, and in the temple and well that temple didn't get destroyed till 70 AD um, and this book doesn't mention that so it's probably mentioned it probably was before then of course or else it would have been mentioned um, the author and date no one quite knows it was known as one of the the writings of Paul for a long long time over a thousand years it was referred to as uh, the writings of Paul um, but there's also different writings, um, very early writings, that it was Barnabas. And there's other ideas, too. Apollos, Silas, Luke, Philip, Priscilla, Aquila, 
Um, so different scholar, or different people are um, thought of to have written this book. It does not have a name that's associated or assigned to it. Um, I like to think maybe Barnabas did it. That would be awesome. But Apollos knew the word really well as well. And Paul, of course, knew the well, words really well. The background um, in settings is definitely the Levitical priesthood. So it's really referencing a lot of Old Testament writings in the book of Leviticus. All the sacrifices that are mentioned there. And, um, and so we're going to find it really Jewish heavy, if you will. Um, and, you know, you might have heard the term apologetics, you know, the idea of uh, defending the faith. Well, here is an apologetic book for sure for the Hebrew people. The writer here is going to make a defense as to the superiority of Jesus Christ above all the things that the Hebrews held in high esteem. And so we'll see that starting with chapter 1. Now, just so you know, too, this person is writing um, the Hebrews more than likely in Jerusalem. And he's probably writing, uh, I mean, you get the idea from the book that he's writing um, uh, a, a kind of a mismatch, uh, mishmash of people. Um, some of them know the Lord. Some of them are, have, are kind of riding the fence. And some of them are really just in skepticism. And so he, he definitely has a apologetic book um, to hit everyone, every person who he's writing. You know, his heart definitely is for his people. Hopefully you have a heart for your, your, your peeps, man, your friends, your family. And, uh, you know, your, uh, you know, uh, you know, Paul said he wished he would be accursed for the sake of his brethren, the Israelites. He loved the Hebrew people. And uh, and that kind of passion to even say that, hey, I wish I was accursed for the sake of my people is super strong. I hope that you have a love for your your friends. You know, I've been fortunate to stay friends with my friends and uh, uh, since high school, junior high and high school. And I love those people. I mean, I do. We don't agree on everything. We don't agree on a lot of things, probably. And as we've gotten older, we've kind of gone different ways in the in the way we think, uh, the way we process things. But you know what, man? I I, I love those guys. I think of them all the time, and uh, I, I just in my heart I have such good vibes um, from my old friends. They all taught me things, w w regardless of them under knowing that they were teaching me anything. Uh, and a lot of that was just uh, just love and compassion and uh, kindness, um, things of that nature that um, uh, I, to this day I'm just very grateful for. And so hopefully you have uh, people in your life that, uh, and you know how to love, you know how to have compassion, um, and, and that's happening in your life. Now, we're just going to jump right in here. God, that's how it starts off. What a great starting to this book. Isn't that cool? God, who at various times and in various ways, many ways, right? Different kinds of ways, various ways, various times, God spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, right? God spoke to his people, Israel, through the prophets, but has in these last days spoken to us by his son, by the son by his son, right? Isn't that great? You know, you some people still focus on a prophet for their, their, um, you know, their faith. You know, they have a certain prophet of the sect that they're a part of, or they're in some group that has a special prophet or a special group that they call the prophet or something like that. Where here it says, Hey, God in times past spoke to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. And the son is going to be the focus of this book, man. This is a Jesus book. You know, if you want to know Jesus, read the Gospels. If you want to know the Jesus 
uh, the, how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament, as Jesus said he was the fulfillment of it, read the book of Hebrews. I mean, we are going to just get knee deep, really cool. And this morning, I want to just get you to see something really neat in the flow of this. So I'm not going to break down everything in the book. There's so much to break down here. And uh, and I'm not going to do it in a Devo style, you know, but I want you to see what the writer's saying. Hey, guess what? Times past, God spoke through the prophets. Today, he's spoken to us by his son. These are the last days, the Messiah days. The Messiah days are the last days. And that's how they saw it. When the Messiah came, that was the last days. It's been the last days, by the way, for a long, long time now. And um, so it says, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they." This is a radical introduction to Jesus. Let me tell you. I mean, this is one of brightness. The brightness, the term is used only here in the New Testament. It expresses the concept of sending forth light or shining. The meaning of, quote, reflection is not appropriate. It doesn't mean reflection. Some versions have that. The sun is not just reflecting God's glory. He is God and radiates his own essential glory. He is the brightness. It says he is the express image of God's person. The term translated express image is used only here in the New Testament. In extra biblical lit literature, it was employed as an engraving on wood, an etching in metal, a brand on animal hide or an impression in clay as a stamped image on coins. Person is a word expressing nature, being, or essence. The sun is the perfect imprint, the exact representation of the nature and essence of God in time and space. He upholds everything in the universe. Whoa, that's crazy, right? The universe and everything in it consistently sustained by the sun's power and effectual word. In the beginning, God created. He upholds everything. Amazing. The term also conveys the concept of movement or progress. The Son of God directs all things toward the consummation of all things. According to God's sovereign purpose, he who spoke all things into existence also sustains his creation and consummates his pers person by his word. Woo! Man, that is heavy stuff. What that's basically saying is Jesus is God. <laughs> and um, there's a just a super, super amazing apologetic uh, that the writer gives us there as to the deity of Christ. And he's going to all through this chapter. So he says that he um, by himself, Jesus by himself purged our sins. Isn't that cool? Your sins are purged, man. You're done. You're purged. Your sins are done. They're purged. They're forgiven. He purged our sins. I love that. Purged our sins. Um, that's such a cool word. Should be a name of a band. Purge our sins. He sat down at the right hand of who? The majesty of on high. Hey everybody, good morning. I hope you guys are enjoying this reading so far. It's super awesome. Having become so much better, got me a pencil, better. That's our word for this book. Jesus is better. When I started a ministry 15 years or so ago called Running Light Ministries, we have shirts that say better pleasure. Why? Because of this book, Jesus is better. That's the whole point. And it's apologetic book, you know. You might, you know, in, in our world, people might argue this or that or what's going on or justice or this thing or that or that or that. But the question is, is what's better? You know, is Jesus's way better? And that's what Jesus always is bringing up. My way is better. Build on the rock. Don't build on the sand. Build on the rock. Everybody's building on something. Jesus says, I am the better thing to build on. I am 
that rock. So having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, why is he going to talk about angels? Because in the Jewish world, angels were gigantic. They, have, they thought so much about angels, had so many different ideas on angels, very, very angelic-oriented faith um, Judaism is. Uh, obviously, uh, for good reasons, the Bible talks in the Old Testament about angels. And uh, angels mediated the Old Testament law with Moses and God. And so angels are seen quite a bit. Uh, the angel during the Passover, the angel of the Lord, um, angels all over the place, um, uh, just read through the Bible, man, and it's it's, uh, it's there. So we're going to see that he's going to now defend what he's saying. He's saying that Jesus is better than the angels. Well, how can Jesus be better than the angels? I mean, the angels don't die, and yet Jesus died. I mean, Jesus was a human. You're saying humans are better than angels? What are you talking about? You could see people uh, in the in the Hebrew culture questioning this. Now, what does this guy do? What does the author do? to defend the faith does he just go hey you know what you guys believe what you believe and i'll believe what i believe no he studies he actually looks into the scripture and this is what you need to do you need to look into the scripture and take the time in your life to look in there now he quotes from the old testament all the time in this book i'm not going to go through every quote but you should and so maybe when you get a chance go through chapter one and look at the quotes that we're going to read right now and look for those quotes in the Old Testament. If you have a study Bible, it'll have its references right there in the margins and tell you where to find them. For instance, verse 5 says, To which of the angels did God ever say, quote, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, where's that at? If you look at your study Bible, you're going to see it says go to verse 5 of your study of your uh, concordance and it'll say Psalm 2 verse 7 and that's where you'll find you are my son today I have begotten you it's also in 2 Samuel 7:14 as the writer presents the unique relationship which the son has with the father no angel ever experienced such a relationship so the, the son is spoken of in the Old Testament, and the son has a unique relationship that is different than the angels have with the father. And again, in verse 5, it says, quoted, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So there's another quote there. Firstborn, that word in Greek, member is prototokos. It means the, um, the uh, firstborn as the preeminent one, the preeminent born. Remember that Ephraim in Jeremiah 31, was he the firstborn? No. Who was the firstborn? Uh, was, uh, who, is, who is Ephraim's brother? Does anybody remember out there? Who was Ephraim's brother? It was Manasseh. And Manasseh was born first, but Jeremiah 31 says that Ephraim was born first. If you look at the Psalms in Psalm 89, verse 27, it's referring to King David as being the firstborn. Was King David the firstborn? No. The term firstborn in Colossians 1 and here in Hebrews is a term prototokos, and it just means the preeminent one. But to, again, when he brings his preeminent one his firstborn, right, the, 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 the son of promise into the world. He says, let all the angels of God worship him. Again, quotes. So they're Old Testament quotes. Let all the angels of God worship him. Who deserves to be worshipped? God alone, right? What is the first two commandments, right? Uh, don't break the commandments. Don't worship a false deity, right? But all the angels are told to worship the son. Right? Will, will God share his glory with another? The, the question is asked by Isaiah, right, through the Holy Spirit. Will God share his glory? No way, man. He's God. He alone is God. He's not going to have you worship something else. Right? 
when John bowed down to the angels in the book of Revelation, the angels went, yo, bro, do, what are you doing? Right? Don't be bowing down to me. That's idol worship. Worship God. God alone. Worship the Lord alone. Yet the Bible teaches that all the angels will bow down to the Son and worship. Right? Every knee shall bow before Jehovah, the book of Isaiah says. And that is quoted in Psalm, or Philippians chapter 2. Right? Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. That's a quote from the book of Isaiah. Yeah. Isn't that cool? So all these, the way apologetics is working is there uh, to the Hebrew people by the author is he's just quoting the Old Testament. He's just showing him how Jesus is better, how he's superior. And so what does this have to do with your life? Well, is Jesus superior? If you know Jesus is being superior, you're going to go to him, right? He's better. He's superior. And you know, wherever our desires are, that's where we tend to go, isn't it? Where our desires are, that's where we tend to go, Right? We always can justify um, desires because we always go, oh, well, you know, I, I like doing it and da, da 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 and it makes me feel good and things like that. And a lot of times it's hard for us to see our failures because we tend to ride on our desires. We tend to go to where our desires are and they make us happy. And, um, well, God wants to be a better desire. And that's what we're always asking. God, be a better desire for me. Um, you know, let, let you be the desire of my heart, right? And so I'll read the, the rest of this chapter because it's not too much longer. And it says, and, and the angels, he says, and of the angels, he says. So this is what God says to the angels, quote, who makes his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Whoa, that's intense, right? Very interesting, right? Psalm 104 verse 4 is the reference there. So God says that about the angels. But to the son, God says, quote, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Wow. That is quite a verse. I would have you want to read that one a little more and study it. Psalm 45, 6, and 7. It is a quoted verse right? And that's what he says about the sun. So about the sun, he says, oh, your throne, O oh God. So he's calling the sun who? Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness, the scepter of your kingdom, your reign. You have loved righteousness, hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Wow, he's going to reign. Amazing. Call God, the sun says. He's better than the angels. And, quote, this is what the Son has been told by God. The Lord in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. So what does it say about, what does the Bible say about the sun? What does the author say about the sun? In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. <laughs> I mean, talk about, you know, a lot of people debate the Trinity by going to the New Testament. What does the author of Hebrews says? Oh, you want to debate uh, the, the deity of Christ? Okay, flip open page one. Page one of your Bible. In the beginning, God. And he goes from there. To the Son, he says, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. Wow. I mean, what do you think this author thought about Jesus? Yeah, pretty radical. What do you think about Jesus today? Who do you think Jesus is today? How does that change your life? How does it change your mind? You know, see, if Jesus is all that, then you can go to him. But if he ain't all that, and you can't go to him, right? You won't go to him because he ain't all that. And we can trust that, you know, Jesus can take care of us and that his sacrifice for us is a complete one. He certainly has purged our sins. Isn't that great? It's good to know that they're purged because we have, we have temptation. We bail. We stumble, right? J the book of James says we all stumble in many ways. And it's good to know that our sins are purged. Now, verse 13 says, But to 
which of the angels has he ever said, quote, did he ever, has he said this to the angels? Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Have I ever told the angels? Did God ever say to the, did the father ever say to the angels, hey, come sit next to me and make, till we make our enemies uh, a footstool? This is Psalm chapter 2, I'm pretty sure again. Um, 13, yeah, Psalm 110, sorry, 110 verse 1. Um, so, and are they not all ministering, now he says to the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Aren't angels ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? Hey, isn't that a crazy passage on angels? that they're ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. Have you ever been touched by an angel? That's kind of what it sounds like it's talking about, huh? Ministering spirits sent forth. You know, very, very, very cool passage for sure. So Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. That's what this passage is talking about. And man, that certainly helps me out in my day, just to know I can bring in anything, all my cares. I can cast my cares upon my Lord. My Lord cares for me. You know, he's got direction for me too, even in troubled times, Lord. He can help me establish uh, my mind firm in him, on him, uh, that he can be the foundation, that I can be a house that cannot be blown over if I s establish myself on him and I do what he says to do. And he says to trust him. And he says to forgive others. And he says to, to move away from things. He says to trust him with those things. To amputate the things I need to amputate. Cut off those things. Work on things in my life. Do those things. Do those things in faith. Trust the Lord. God, I'm doing this in faith. I want to trust your words. I want you to be better. You know, and that's what the author is getting at right now. So what a great start to this book. We're going to just keep rolling through the chapters. And I hope you guys have a great day as you maybe look through these quotes, okay? You take care. Bye-bye.